Hello, and welcome to Ben Yo Chats. If you're curious about the world, this show is for you. What questions should theatre ask today? On this episode, I speak to Mark Ravenhill. We discuss how Mark is thinking about theatre, his plans as co-artistic director of the King's Head Theatre, and his creative practice. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast. Thank you. Enjoy. Hey, everyone. I'm super excited to be chatting with Mark Ravenhill. Mark, I believe, is one of our greatest living theatre makers and has recently been appointed co-artistic director of the King's Head Theatre. Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. Hi. Hey, so I have to confess, I don't think I know as much about queer theatre as I would like, or perhaps better, all the stories which would be placed under the rainbow flag. But I guess looking back at a lot of British theatre programming over the years, I kind of feel like my opportunity to learn about these stories has been relatively limited. Um, and I think you've announced an ambition to better represent these stories. I was wondering whether you could tell me what you're thinking about and why and what you hope to achieve and do. Yeah, I think um, in the last uh, 15, 20 years or so, there's, there's been quite an absence of those stories, particularly on the big stages. Um, and there was quite a flurry of activity in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and I think when, when we think of representation, I think on the whole, or maybe naively, or maybe I, I only thought, I think maybe naively, we think once you've made a step forward, you can't take a step back. But I think in some ways, um, gay stories, and because of historically when it happened, they did tend to be dominated by sort of white male gay stories, but, but they, they became really quite fashionable in the theatre in the eight, uh, late 80s and into the 90s, and are probably a beneficiary of that. But you just sort of assume that once uh, those voices are there and those stories are being told, that somehow that's going to continue. And then I think there was a real sense of um, fashion changing. And actually, for a young person arriving in London, where, you know, I'm thinking of myself arriving in London, obviously, uh, but I think the situation pertains to quite a lot of the country or the rest of the country, uh, there was suddenly an, an absence of those stories. And I think the, the gatekeepers, if we call them that, had sort of moved on and, and found that all a bit unfashionable. But I think now, uh, particularly that we've got a much wider definition and uh, sometimes you know we use this great long LGBTQ plus or even add in other letters and sometimes uh, squeeze that down to queer but now we've got a much more of a, of, of a wider sense of those identities maybe than lots of those plays of the 80s and 90s did that were non-binary things and gender fluid things and trans people and, um, and, and, and a whole sort of spectrum as you said this sort of rainbow flag that there are so many stories there to be told and so much to explore that um yeah i think it's time to to come back with that agenda and actually it's it's actually a different agenda from the 80s and 90s it's this much more broader more diverse more sort of fluid definition so you know it's always exciting when you feel that there's stories that have never been heard before and experiences that haven't been heard on a on a stage and I'm, I've always been interested in reaching out to the big stages as well. So I think there's a lot of valid work done when a community speaks to itself, but I'm also excited about the possibilities when that community takes their works onto bigger stages and all sorts of people come and experience that work. And I think, I think uh, you know, we're seeing some major revivals of things like uh, Angels in America and The Normal Heart but obviously they're, Amer they're American and they're from a few few decades ago. So I think there's a sense that, that somewhere like the National is looking for those, those bigger stories. And at the moment is programming those, you know, great plays and, and revivals of those great plays, but are exciting to incubate a group of artists that could go on and tell stories on those big stages. So I guess you're becoming a gatekeeper now yourself. Are yeah. you hoping to, <laughs> both I guess catalyze these type of stories but also act as a kind of platform to go on to larger stages like you say at the national because sometimes they require a sort of 
I guess, feeder or some people who are more sensitive to these wider range of stories where the kind of big institutional lethargy of some of the large institutions are not so, uh, you know, set up to finding these type of stories. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily just been the case of of the gatekeepers. I mean, I think a lot of the, and I, I think maybe a lot of queer artists didn't find playwriting that interesting at a certain mm. stage. And a lot of the energies went into performance art and cabaret and and performative all sorts of other things i think i think maybe you know it wasn't all inflicted from outside i think i think for whatever reason sort of chicken egg thing the lots of those art artists were interested in other things other than than writing plays so sometimes it's even just saying to somebody yeah it's great that you're making all this other work but maybe think about also uh producing a written a written text and it's my you know, it's my um, aspiration that some of those artists would go on to want to write for those bigger stages and claim their place in somewhere like the National. But some of those artists might not want to. I mean, I've, you know, there's a completely legitimate other line of thought where people say, I want to speak to my community and I want to do it in, in spaces within that community. And that's a completely uh, legitimate thing. I think I'm just there to say, when we're developing work, but also think about maybe do you do you want to be speaking to a wider audience do you want to be in the big institutions or in the west end and how much of your voice can you carry through into those big spaces but you know lots of artists might say oh, it doesn't interest me at all i don't want i don't want to do that do you think you might like to work with a recurring set of creators and artists uh, as well as bringing in sort of new artists and things like that? Or will it be more sort of, I guess, traditionally thought of as bringing in new programming to, to a kind of space and work? I mean, I think that's always, a, you know, that's always the balance to be struck when you're running any sort of theatre and maybe to other organisations. All I know about my whole life is theatre. But, but you want to build up relationships uh, to have a sort of family of people who return so that there's an ongoing dialogue. But you also want to refresh that and 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 bring in new voices. So I think um, getting that balance right between an ongoing conversation with a group of artists and and bringing in people who are new as well. That's that's always you know one of the things on the dashboard that you're keeping an eye on. I think. Right. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And. I consider you a theatre maker, and you've, I think, said that term to yourself as well. Uh, and obviously, a lot of your artistic practice is around the writing and the writing of a play. And some of it, though, is about the workshopping, also the people and the, the collaborative uh, theatre making. Um, do you view your work also in this way? And, and do you think that kind of importance of that theatre making piece where, although you might have a writing text or writer at a centre, or, or maybe even not, that collaborative aspect of of theatre is something that you'd hope to uh, do more of or consider in your work? Yeah, I mean, it took me a long time to uh, reconcile myself to the fact that, that I was going to be uh, defined as a playwright, because I just think when I started uh, making up plays in my bedroom, I literally didn't know there were there were different things. I thought you just, you know, you, you, you did everything. So uh, made made the costumes, made the sets, made up the words, acted it out, knocked on the neighbours' doors and got them to come around and watch it. Um, so, yeah, and yeah, so I think, um, you know, and historically, uh, and on a rather bigger scale than just me in my bedroom, but historically, um, you know, there hasn't been such, always such a strict division. It's probably been at its strictest in the sort of last last century. And getting stricter, really, that you know, as we squeeze out things like actor managers and stuff like that, that you're an actor or a writer or a director or designer. Um, that's quite a sort of uh, anomaly, really, in the history of theatre that those things are so so divided. So I sort of, you know, but I found that the thing that uh, uh, sort of carried me the furthest was 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 my writing. Um, and maybe that is the bit of it that I'm, I'm best at, or I've, I've got the best at. Um, but yeah, so I do sort of, you know, it's fantastic that, that my writing has, has carried me 
so far I'm very lucky to have worked with people that I've worked and have the work produced that I have but there is always part of me that slightly wrestles against that and thinks but I I want to be a part of the whole process of making making theatre and you you know directed and I think you've even performed as well I don't think you've gone quite as far as all the way to what we might call live art but uh I mean, almost everything within the performative yeah I did do a sort of live art a bit of performative stuff I did a sort of performance piece on in Berlin at the nightclub Bergheim with a trans DJ and sort of found text and to a group of people mostly drunk and on drugs I think at about two o'clock in the morning okay. in, in that's Bergheim. very live art yeah <laughs> in Bergheim so that was pretty you know that was sort of Berlin Berlin Kunst yeah yeah, well, actually, um, now that you brought up uh, Germany, so you've done quite a lot of uh, work in Germany and your, and your work has been there and you've been quite close to some German artistic practice. I was wondering whether you could comment on whether British theatre or what British theatre could learn from the German ways of doing things. I guess there's a kind of their process. Uh, they tend to have longer rehearsal periods from what I can tell and perhaps a more collaborative way of working and maybe also a little bit of their funding because maybe their funding allows that all sort of the organizational part. Do you think yeah, there's much I mean, that British theatre can learn or is it just too different for It's such a difference. It, it, it's such a different way. Uh, everything about it is so different. And I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating about theatre is that, you know, that's whatever it is, an hour, an hour and a half on a plane journey. And yet the whole sense of what theatre is, how it functions, uh, is, so, is so different. Um, that in this globalised world, uh, where lots of other areas of life will be pretty much the same from one European country to another, and maybe even from one continent to another. Actually, the whole notion of what theatre is uh, can vary from you know country country to country. So I think the the whole central German idea of why the theatre is there, the amount of money that they that they give it, um, the whole yeah everything about it is so. Is, is so different that I think um, there's not so much we can just copy. I mean, I think I think German theatre became quite fashionable in the last sort of 10, 15 years. And uh, so, so you see productions in London where obviously director and designer have spent a weekend in Berlin and seen work at the primarily the Schaubühne. And some of the aesthetic is copied, but that's very much just like, you know, copying a little mm. corner of the packaging of the, of, of the pie. Um, it, yeah, and, and so, so yes, there's a few little design elements that are sort of copied and maybe a little attempt to copy some of the uh, acting style. But I think really it's, you know, without that history, without that culture, without, I think what you have to admire is just the centrality of theatre in, in German culture and the thoroughness of, with which it's made and reinvestigate that centrality and thoroughness in terms of our history and our culture. I don't think it's that productive just to copy the sort of superficial layer of the aesthetic. Yeah, I think I'd have to agree. I mean, I've even seen it in America. Good, I hope you will, Ben. <laughs> where, yeah, <laughs> where I've seen, you know, I, I know a little bit about some of those. And that you could, yeah, like you say, copy some of the surface things. But that's kind of just the surface element of kind of a long either body of work or a historical tradition or a way of yeah. working. Yeah. Which you can't kind of just pluck out theatre. It's, prim it's primarily the Ostermeyer, Ostermeyer productions because they travel so widely. If you go to Australia, lots of Australian theatre is influenced by that. It's quite influence on American theatre now as well um, and even Ostermeyer is not typical of German theatre in some ways he's a bit of an outlier in German theatre he's a bit more um, sort of realism really and and text and stuff than a lot of it's not quite it's not anywhere near as sort of postmodern and deconstructed and stuff as as the majority of German theatre so it's nice in a way because uh, i think he's fa he's fantastic his work's fantastic but he's he's sort of almost thought of as german theater for the rest of the world but in germany he's considered to be quite a quite different yeah. quite different yeah yeah 
And do you think, I guess we can't really learn from it necessarily, but like you say, because the theatre funding, I guess it's mostly state funding, but quite well funded, uh, or at least well funded, at least from where I see British theatre is. Yeah. And I reckon that can't really be uh, replicated, I guess. But do you think that's at the core of some of why a German, and past the history and everything, but it gives them that uh, ability to do that? Or I guess you have other problems sometimes when you're, you know, very state directed or, you know, you, I guess theatre makers always have to rely on another source of funding, typically not just box office. And that causes uh, kind of a set of problems and challenges in itself. Yeah, I mean, the German theatre is, uh, you know, it, it comes out of Germany unifying from all those tiny little states and every duke and every court wants to have its own, its own theatre. Um, and quite often, well, and I think always look sort of funded by the local prince or the local duke, was it like 70 states or something, all those little principalities. Uh, so, so that structure is still in place and the, and the state has sort of replaced the, 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 the funding of the, the duke or the, it's obviously very simplified. Um, but it does mean there's almost, there's very little commercial, commercial theatre. And I think there is something healthy that comes, comes from the dialogue between subsidised theatre and commercial theatre. In, in in the UK, so um, there there often is a sense of like sort of civic duty of going to the theatre in Germany, and you can sort of see people start to behave differently, and as they get closer and closer to the show coming down, putting on their special art faces and behaving in their special art way, and it can be a bit deadening sometimes. So I think uh, an English audience tends to just carry on behaving pretty much like they would at a friend's house or in the pub or whatever, when often in the theatre. And um, I'm not saying one thing's better than the other, but they're different. And, it's, and, and I think there are some benefits to the English is just sort of ease and lack of uh, lack of a special art head that, that looks yeah. like this is something with a, with, a, with a sort of reverence. Does Germany have their equivalent of like a pantomime or something like that? Oh, or, God, or, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, exactly. That is very, yeah, I didn't that's, think so. Uh, yeah, I, just most, thought, yeah. I, I don't think any country, I mean, I love pantomime. <laughs> yeah. it's, I think that's, that, that's very, very English. Uh, no, you wouldn't have anything. Yeah. I, I don't, if anybody from Germany can... can yeah, <laughs> maybe there's a bit tradition we don't know about. It's almost impossible yeah. <laughs> to understand what... Um, it's almost impossible to understand what pantomime is, I think, if you're outside of, yeah. outside of the UK. There's some great, like, cabaret stuff in... In, in Berlin um, and I mean there is a whole other scene there outside of the subsidized theatre um, in different in, in different cities but it's not pantomime. Yeah and they don't they don't have as much well I don't really know my perception is they don't have as much corporate sponsorship either oh, which is theatre the, hands or hardly any I think yeah I think that would be considered why you know if something is so revered and so be really uh, weird cent central to the life of the city and the civic process i mean it's still you know sort of quite close to a sort of greek ideal of it being part of the civic life of the community um you wouldn't really want to put that together with corporate money i mean a bit wider more in some of the other bits of the german-speaking world i think austria is more sort of re relaxed about that uh, is the impression I get, but if anybody, there might be people, there will be people who will know a lot more about this, and if they're listening to this, then I'm very happy to be corrected, because I'm speaking in generalizations. Yes, uh, of course, I, I, I kind of mentioned it because actually that's one of the things I think which has changed over my sort of British theatre observation is that corporate money over the years has become a stronger force, and that's partly because there's been less state funding, so you need money to make on theatre, and I do think that has... I can't quite cut my finger on it, but I do think it has coloured, uh, not necessarily, you know, saying whether it's a bad or good colour, people can debate that, but has coloured the kind of work which has uh, come on to some degree. Yeah. It, yes, I, I guess it must have done. It's, it's hard to unpick it and know, and know how, how it has. Um, yeah, I think it's, yes, I think it's a mix. Good. Yeah. Yes, I don't really know what, what know. effect it's had, but it must have had some. Yeah. Something. So, and you've written across uh, many forms. So sort of a kind of typical sort of straight play, but you've done opera, you've done musicals, you've done, I guess, what people might consider high art and, and low art uh, forms. And it strikes me uh, you're always... I wrote a pantomime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So always kind of practicing and, and learning. And do, do you think that's core to kind of how you see your creativity as opposed to like, oh, I'm just going to write this, this type of thing? Or I guess this is a kind of form function, how, how you've written kind of so widely across so many forms. Yeah, I think um, I, I was 30 when I had my first play produced, which isn't so old, but it's in terms of having your first play produced, it's a little bit older than some people. But I've, And I've been working in theatre for nearly a decade by then. So I could sort of see that lots of people's playwriting career was, uh, for many people, just one one play, and then they would disappear off. I'm not, Classic one into, hit wonder at the Royal Court, and you never hear from normal, them again. Normally, in, normally into TV development, and often make more, you know, make quite a good living for 20, 30 years after that. Maybe even with something not being made, but being in TV and film uh, script development, um, and sometimes a second play, sometimes a third play, but you know only a tiny handful anything after after a third play and uh you know i'd loved theater since i was one and wanted to make theater since i could remember so i think i was quite clear from the beginning now that i'd managed to actually get something on and get it you know on and in the you know i still think the best uh sort of beginning for a career have you first play at, at, at the royal court uh i got my foot in the door i wasn't going to take it out again. <laughs> and i wanted to stay there for the rest <laughs> of my stay there for the rest of my life. So I think I was pretty conscious of like pacing myself and, and thinking, okay, I've got my foot in the door at 30, you know, I'm not gonna let them take it out until I'm at least 80, so that's 50 years. Um, so pacing myself and trying different uh, forms and working in different relationships, sometimes being more of a collaborator, uh, you know, sometimes, being the servant of a much bigger sort of project or sometimes very solely authored right down to just writing my own monologue and performing it. The, all, all the different permutations of how you could be as a, as a writer making a piece of live theatre uh, would just sort of pace me through that time but also keep on making me question and learn. Um, so I think, I, I'm not sure I could have articulated it exactly as that when I very first started, but I had that instinct and I searched around for, for, for those collaborations and different, and different possibilities. Because I think there's probably only so many totally original authored plays in you. There's probably not, unless you're extraordinary, there's probably not 50 of them. Yeah. There's probably one every year that you could write for 50 years. So Even Shakespeare didn't manage 50, I don't think. Well, no, maybe some are lost, but he managed 30, 36. <laughs> and he was, dead. he was dead. Like, I'm older than Shakespeare when he died. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was fitted, but that's one, one thing of, I think of your brilliance is, you know, this multi-decade career across uh, many different forms. And then this aspect of, how would I put it, almost lifelong learning aspect. I mean, in the beginning, yeah. learning about operas, but then, you know, you more recently we can talk about even things sort of slightly askance, like learning ballet, but learning poetry, thinking about philosophy. Um, and I'm always really interested by creatives and artists who have this lifelong learning, you know, obviously deep in their own, say, core art, but have all of these adjacent arts, where some of them, they go very deep. Has that been really important to you and what have you learned and is that like just enriched your own creative process or does it just feel your curiosity just takes you down that path and you kind yeah, of have I to think, say yeah I think it's largely curiosity um when I w when I went to university and for the first time uh really had access to you know a properly huge library rather than just your sort of local library with the sort of large print books for the pensioners and all of that sort of stuff. When, when I had access to a proper big uh, library at Bristol, I could never um, just stick to anything that was on, on a syllabus or a course. So that was one of the things I discovered there, like age 18, just wandering through the stacks and getting drawn one day to maybe read something about philosophy or history or economics or, or anything. Or anything. So uh, I did quite a lot of that at university, just sort of uh, almost like spin the wheel and find out what. But I mean, as a way, obviously, of like not doing the work that I was <laughs> supposed to do. So, um, so I was either in the library doing that, or in or in the student union, making plays where we, where we just uh, put on our own productions. There was no um, 
it was a separate from any study. Uh, so I didn't do very much of, of anything that was on the syllabus, but I did do like half my time doing this sort of random reading and half the time uh, practically putting on plays with my with my peers. So I think I just sort of continued that practice really. I just sort of got that, I just, yeah, just that curiosity. So just over the years, I, I mean, I still do the same if I go into a library or go into foils or whatever, is just have a wander around and maybe get drawn to an economics book or, I mean, not heavy economics, but, uh, you know, sort of pop economics or, on the whole, they're pop, these books I'm talking about. Um, yes, and and I think, um, and I hope, I think, Probably that does feed into the playwriting. Uh, I don't think it can certainly can't hurt to to be think, thinking about those those things. Um, yeah, I think to be a bit more of a rounded person because obviously in the last thirty years, English education has become very uh, national curriculum and everything driven. So education has become more and more about not looking off the path and just focusing on exactly the things that you, an examiner needs to tick to, to pass you. And I was just a little bit before that time. So there's still a little bit of space in education to, to be able to look off the path. Um, and I think that that to me is really, is really important. So I think if you, if that sort of national curriculum thing is very much in your blood there's a danger that you just carry that through the rest of your life so if you set yourself the task of being a playwright all you do is move between different at the beginning of your career move between different playwriting groups reading each other's plays and reading plays that are no older than the ones that have been published in the last five years and it becomes quite a sort of inward looking sort of circle so your questions become quite narrow yeah, almost and, circular. And, yes, and often without any reference to contemporary literature or contemporary visual arts. That's another thing German theatre is very good at. It's very au fait with what's happening in contemporary visual arts. Uh, we don't tend to have much of a crossover in our theatres, unless it's very much sort of performance art. We don't tend to have much of a crossover between what's what's happening in contemporary visual art and, and the theatre. So it just makes life more pleasurable as well, just, just to yeah. uh, have a slightly sort of uh, Radio 4 sort of Mel Melvin Bragg sort of attitude to the world where you're just sort of, uh, you know, finding out little bits of interesting stuff about the latest developments in whatever. I the history of. Well, I, I'm not I feel in any of them, yeah. but I must, you know, sort of bits and bobs. Well read enough. Yeah. I mean, I feel it infuses your work. Um, I'm, I guess that raises two things for me. One was on the visual art thing you commented on. Um, but the second, I guess, was the process, because it seems to me that you do enough reading and research around whatever you're interested in. Uh, but you don't go to the nth degree, and then you will you will write your piece or your draft. And then you actually have uh, a very important kind of, I guess, either rehearsal or workshopping uh, period that you do. And I've been interested in, I guess, all of us working from home for this period <laughs> is that kind of workshopping in-person element. Uh, I guess you can sort of continue just writing your drafts and, and now it's reopened. Has that been a, um, a really difficult missing element? And have I misportrayed, you know, a very, you know, surface outline of how you, of how you like to work and, and that in-person bit uh, that we've had at the moment, has that been uh, a really difficult missing part for you? Yeah, I mean, I haven't found over the years that, um... I haven't found like extensive workshopping that useful. Um, I think, uh, unless you're joining a company to sort of with a different position as a writer to sort mm. of serve, serve, you know, sometimes you place yourself sort of lower down the hierarchy, if you like, and you're sort of creating material for a company where, where in a way the directors and the advisors or whatever are more important. I've some couple of times put myself in that situation. But if I'm writing a play, which is which is my play, I actually have sometimes found workshops. Uh, they're just taking up time when you could be what you could be getting Work the, again. Yeah, getting the play better, and and tr you know lots of voices being being added in that you somehow then feel a bit obligated to try and satisfy them and go up some blind alleys doing that. Um, what is really useful is to hear is to hear a play out loud. I, that's normally all I all I need, really. Uh, it 
jumps off you straight away where the play comes to life and where the play um, is treading water or where the play absolutely <laughs> just hits the deck. Um, so I've been very lucky during the lockdown because uh, we set up uh, a group of friends who I was at university with. Um, we've been doing online Saturday night Zoom readings of entirely new work. So, uh, so all the stuff that I've been working on, I've had a chance to hear uh, over the last, well, coming up for 18 months now, isn't it? And we've, read, and we've read other writers' work, and sometimes I've mentored young writers, and we've read their work and stuff. But yeah, but actually the process of, of um, any time I want to, being able to hear what I've, what I've read has, has uh, been made possible during, during the lockdown. And then we have a nice chat about it afterwards. And, and, and because they've all gone off into the world and become doctors and social workers and historians and all sorts of things, then actually they're... There's normally somebody, whatever I've written about, who knows a lot more about it than, than me. So that, that's, that's been really useful, actually, reading it with a group of people. We were all in university together and did plays together, but you know, inevitably most people have gone off and done different stuff. Yeah. Loads of really interesting different stuff. So that's actually really useful to read your play with people who are, you know, who, who can Engaged audience, yeah, as opposed yeah. to a narrow drama tag or, or yeah, something who like can, that. Who, who can read them because they're very literate people um, and and they did some university acting so they so they read them well but then actually they've also got this huge sort of hive mind with pretty much know everything about everything so I've been able to feed off that as well and I said no no the, the thing with whatever it might be radiotherapy is you wouldn't do that you would do whatever so yeah it's, that's been amazing. Yeah I can really see on that feedback I, I, actually I'm not sure if you would recall but the only time I've actually sort of been forced onto uh, the London stage. I say all the time, I actually done a couple <laughs> of more pieces of recent, was a rehearsed reading for an early version of The Cut, where I oh. think um, I was assisting John Tiffany. And oh, yeah. there was that, and I, I played Gita, who thankfully had no lines <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, in, the, in the scene that I had, uh, or actually the whole reading. Uh, but the learning process, just sitting in a rehearsal room, even for me there as a kind of, um, fledgling creative was extremely informative both listening and then you know the discussion and you and John and Hanning and occasionally uh, you know observation or that but that working was was really important for a sort of a live um, a live feedback piece yeah so yeah. you've written a kind of very personal piece recently addressing sort of memory dementia uh, your mother's story but partly yours and your father's and also that form of work seemed to also uh you know very much represent the kind of story and uh, and the like of that uh was being kind of almost memoir type of piece did you approach that uh differently and again I guess there's you know learning ballet and and all of that um how was that for you <laughs> yeah I mean I'd never uh written anything anywhere near as sort of autobiographical as that uh, I hadn't really thought that what I wanted to do. And I was quite surprised at the beginning of my career, you know, with shopping and fucking, I sort of gradually came to realize that lots of people were assuming, particularly with the first play, that it was autobiographical. <laughs> and then I thought, well, that makes me a slightly more uh, dangerous <laughs> than, I, than I am then. But it was quite weird to realize that people thought, oh, you must have written your life down in, in shopping and fucking. Uh, which was, you know, there's some emotional truth in there, I'm sure that you draw them, but uh, my life was, you know, nothing like any of those characters. Um, and I, yeah, and I, I didn't want to, I certainly didn't start off wanting to write like my life. But yeah, but then, you know, eventually I got to the stage where I thought, well, you've never written anything that's actually uh, autobiographical. So you should do that because maybe, you know, there's some avoidance going on there or something. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, then I'm really going to do it. I'm not going to slightly change the names or slightly change this. Up. Everybody's going to have the real names and um, and the real place names and everything. And uh, I'll be as true as I can with, you know, you have to compress things to fit them into a time frame. You have to, you know, there's, there, there, there's some stuff where, where you have to sort of uh, change things a bit to, to make them a just fit into a 90 minute minute play uh but as little as possible i 
I, I tried to do that. So actually, once I'd made that decision to um, to just be that autobiographical, then um, actually, then it was pretty much the same process as writing a play. In fact, it was you know a little bit of a shortcut there because you sort of knew these characters in this world and this story inside out. So then crafting scenes out of them and then crafting a structure out of them was still a job of work, but it was it was pretty much the same job of work as if I'd invented characters and story and stuff. That just would have taken me that bit longer to, I guess, to imagine fictional things. Uh, so it goes through this sort of process of being shaped. And, and by the time it comes out, Although it's drawn on the truth, it starts it starts to sort of have a life of its own. So I never let any I never let things happen that definitely didn't happen in real life. But sometimes you take two or three events, compress them, make them happen on one day when they would have been spread out over a couple of years, or what you know, do all these little things. So I'm sure in the end it comes out becoming a sort of parallel universe event, uh, but but drawing as much as I could on on the truth and obviously we all remember things differently so my dad claims not to remember some of the things that were in the play where i remember them very clearly and um so you have to go well some of that's filtered through my memory and then other stuff is filtered through stuff my mum told me i wasn't there for stuff that happened before i was born so it's often her version of things so she remembered it in one way so uh you know it's it, in some ways it's just a record of different people's memories and their they can be quite uh, inaccurate, can't they? Yeah, storified. In <laughs> fact, I was, I was speaking a couple of weeks ago to Lee Simpson, who has this idea that the further back in history you go, we, we storify our lives, I'm sure. either through our own memories or filtered through, uh, filtered through other people's memories. Um, so what, what did you learn from learning ballet? I think you've sort of commented that it's, you go into ballet and you kind of just have to dance. So it's almost a kind of mindfulness Med meditation type of aspect but does it help people through that it's definitely a mindfulness to it yeah yeah i mean it's just it was i don't i'd sort of meant to do it for years and years and years and then uh i finally did a little google search and found that there was a ballet a beginner's ballet class at the city lit uh in the center of london which i really love and i've done lots of little classes and courses there so i signed up for a term of of beginners ballet um yeah it's i i think it's the precision of it it's just very good for suppleness flexibility all sorts of stuff but i i think having to execute these very um precise and demanding sort of moves with this incredibly romantic music going on there's this tension between between the sort of technicality and the precision and the and the music that's quite uh moving to be doing it uh, i think just the music alone i've I find too often too ornate and sort of sugary and mm. too too romantic for my taste. But I realise once you actually combine it with this absolutely fierce sort of discipline, it's the it's the two rubbing up against each other, which yeah, kind of makes the music less overwrought, which it which it usually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which so so yeah, I I found it um, and you know just good to put yourself in a situation where you're definitely not going to be very good at it. Yeah. You can only I mean, lack of experience and everything, and you will never be. You will never. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've in life on the whole wants to be very good at the things that I do. So it's how you have. You know, have to very quickly let go of that and That's go. Okay. Well, I will just throw myself into this, and I will work, and I will do everything that the teacher asks of me. But there's no way, obviously, that I'm ever going. I'll never be able to leap like that. So yeah, yeah. and I'll never any bit in any way be anywhere near a professional ballet stage. So you're just doing it for itself which I haven't done very much in life I think and just going yeah you know I might well by the end of the term still be like the worst person in the class <laughs> but, but that's okay I'm just you know it's uh so that's quite a, yeah that sort of ungoal orientated sort of uncompetitive sort of thing hasn't haven't often thought like that <laughs> yeah it's a nice break from you're not striving down a kind of measured metered success uh, yeah. success type thing. Uh, some of my friends who like ballet uh, like ballet because they claim they don't find it very uh, political. I, I'm not exactly sure about that, but that that's sort of their claim. 
And then within theater, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's not. Often if you're overtly political, it kind of doesn't, uh, it kind of doesn't work. Um, but I was wondering about what you've thought about, I guess, politics within theatre or, or, you know, how one is that? Because I, I guess a lot of your work has themes you can get through it, but often you're not trying to be in, you know, overtly uh, like a George Orwell or a David Hare kind of really on the nose sort of uh, political point, but more exploring stories or characters uh, and things through that or, or a time or, or a place. Do you think that's uh, like a more... I, I guess I want to say more powerful form of theatre, but just I guess it's a different form and how you, how you view that. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's a big old area, isn't it? But I guess on the whole, my feeling is that um, the actual action of the play and the arc of the play will embody uh, your sense of the world. Um, and you... In many ways you are in control of that but also in some ways you're not you sort of release something by just committing to to telling the story without editorializing or commenting um and if you're genuinely radical then there will be a sort of rad radical energy released by the performance of the play and if you're small c or maybe even big c conservative and maybe don't want to be it'll be it'll that that will, that will be released by by the performance of the play. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, with my own writing, sometimes I look back and thought, you know, that's, you know I tried to get rid of it, but there's still sort of editorializing characters sort of saying things that a bit of a sort of comment and stuff. So in a way, I suppose my sense is like cut out the characters saying political things. And it's the actual central thrust and energy of the play that will release, embody a, a political energy. And that might be very different from how the playwright perceives themselves. I mean, I think that's the main thing is that we work very hard in everyday life and now in uh, virtual life and social media to create a personality, to project an image of ourselves and construct, construct a personality. And I think if playwriting is just another form of uh, constructing that personality which is better and nicer or more or some you know sometimes on Twitter more provocative blah 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 than, than you would be if playwriting is just another continuation of that sort of ego building then it's not so interesting whereas I think if playwriting is a space where that sort of manufactured constructed self and that ego can can be let go of and the play is bigger and maybe says something not says in in one line you could quote but embodies something that maybe you don't even didn't even know you thought or felt or it's a bigger thought or feeling than yours and that to me is sort of it's quite idealistic but to me that is my sort of ideal form of of theater yeah and i think i mean i observe audiences are really drawn to say flawed characters trying really hard at something right this this idea you know there's no really good really evil this that melting point where you know like you said playwrights asking those those kind of questions. Um, I do wonder a little bit though that, uh, I guess this touches on our first original point, that a lot of uh, theatre has been, uh, I guess, left leaning, you know, not really uh, centre right. I kind of think maybe, mm. maybe Tom Stoppard might be, I think his politics is more complicated like that, but maybe out of theirs, yeah. you might say he is a, a little bit, but often not. And then often uh, straight, white, male, broadly elitist, left leaning. And then you look at, well, Britain or the world, and well, I, I guess the British people, again, it's more complicated, but on the surface has generally returned back right-leaning uh, governments, or I think we have a quite a complex politics. But, but again, it's just this yeah. idea that actually the, the more complex plays, which have gone more than just that, have been a little bit more perhaps successful. And I was wondering with this like representation, um, because probably more and more my friends have who aren't really into theatre have had a slightly declining interest in theatre, maybe because it feels it doesn't represent them. And actually that's because they're anything but that. So they, they might be right, but they might be left. They yeah. might be, um, you know, not straight or whatever, whatever colour that it is. Uh, and I, I don't know how true it is, but I was definitely challenged with this idea that actually, you know what, it's, although there are exceptions, you, you're talking to this 
slightly too small box and that's why these efforts of whether it's a rainbow flag or even a center right flag or just anything which isn't old straight white male not to sort of <laughs> you know there's obviously good stuff there but just to kind of put that in that box uh, do you feel that's got any truth to that observation or do you kind of feel that that's oh yeah maybe yeah, not, presented no i think that's i think that's true and i think um you know what's happened in the theater is is representative of of what's happened in in the wider uh country uh so the you know in go, go, going back to the 20s and 30s hundreds and hundreds of little often weekly repertory theaters all over all over the country and actors will be traveling all over the country particularly at the beginning of their their careers being paid terrible money and living in terrible digs but they but actors would be living in all sorts of little little towns up and down the the country and being part of that being part of those communities uh, and then as the 60s and 70s came along lots of those small little unfunded weekly reps closed down but you had a very active network for a while of well-funded regional theatres and still actors were moving around the country and still plays were moving backwards and forwards uh, between those theatres and coming into London and going, going back out so the dialogue between London and, and the rest of the country and Liverpool speaking to Sheffield speaking to London speaking to Brighton or whatever was was going on and um, those regional theatres uh, funding was very very substantially cut in the 80s and has carried on and many many of them closed uh, obviously the whole the whole weekly rep thing went and it but in a way that's been sort of replicated by just the number of fringe theatres in London so it's not quite the same as weekly rep but essentially that very very lowly paid stuff where you might uh, be starting starting your career and hoping that you get somewhere you know, a job where you could actually live on the money and stuff instead of having hundreds of those around the country we, we've got hundreds of fringe theatres some now more in the rest of the country but still very concentrated on London and 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 the amount of touring has, has been cut back and back. So the money, as in the rest of the economy, has been drawn towards London for, for making theatre. And the offer and sometimes the pressure from the Arts Council to tour the work and to share the work outside London has 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 been been taken off. There's been a sort of acceptance that that so it's possible now to write plays and direct plays and act plays and to almost entirely exist within within London and not to see, oh, how does that play, if that, that play gets a second production in Bolton or something, how does that play go down in Bolton? How does that play go down in Scarborough? Or I'm acting, I'm acting in a play, I, oh, the audiences respond in this way in Birmingham. And I, so, you know, so you can see this sort of reflecting the way that of, you know, uh, that everything has become much more focused on London and that sort of alienation that people feel uh, in, in, in a lot of the rest of the country. So I think there's, you know, there's been a lot of exciting uh, moves forward in terms of sort of progressive thought and liberal thought and left thought in terms of people making theatre in London. But I think carrying that out and testing that against a, a wider audience hasn't happened. So, um, I was very uh, keen to uh, do this uh, Boy in the Dress adaptation of the David Williams because it opened in, in Stratford. And it's got a very simple ask of the audience. It's really just saying, how can you actually object if this little boy wants to wear a dress to school? And it's David Williams' book, and it, because it's so charmingly and lovingly constructed, by the end of the book, you just have to go, let the boy wear the dress. But obviously in real life, that's actually still quite a big Ask. Mm. And a big ask. Uh, but if you played that in, um, you know, in Hackney, then um, a chance or you're just going to be on side from, from the beginning. But actually Stratford, um, the audience, many of them do go to the Royal Shakespeare Company quite regularly, but, but, but that area of the country had, I think, the highest number of uh, leave voters in the Brexit referendum of the whole country. <laughs> I think we often say, oh, it was the Northeast and stuff, but I think I might be right. That bit of the Midlands had an even higher. So it is quite a, well, it's, I think it's an area of the country that thinks very different from 
from, from London. London. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought, it'd be, yeah, I thought it'd be really, it was more exciting to open that that play there, and of course, still because it's just so charming, and you can't argue with it. Uh, that that three generations of families often come to those shows, and grandparents buy the tickets, bring mum and dad, bring the kids, um, and they all go on this journey with the character Dennis and his dad and his community, who all get to the stage of going, oh, let the boy wear the dress. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a much more exciting journey to go on. With um, with those with with people from that area of the Midlands, because as you say, we are a strange sort of bundle of sort of contradictions. So, although we keep on returning right wing gov governments, everybody's become much more. So many more people have become much more liberal about things, and there's still this underlying sort of sense of fair play and justice in 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 the British. Yeah, side. we like we like the underdog. You know, yeah, we have a, a sense of fairness. I mean, and a faith in things like, you know, just basic faith in our national health service, and we believe in gun control. You know, with, with, you don't even hear very cranky voices arg arguing for 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 more gun. So we're very different from from America in that respect. But I don't. I've never come across anybody who's lob lobbying for guns and. Although some people think it, very little criticism in NHS's voice. So lots of our core values are really still quite socialist, really. So so we are a whole bundle of contradictions, uh, and 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 yeah, in a story like David's Boy in the Dress, our sense of fair play and as you say, the underdog, means that in the end we might be cheering on something uh, that's really quite a sort of liberal cause and could be framed in another in another way to another audience that might be a more complex argument about trans rights and all sorts of things. Uh, and this is, and it, this story doesn't dig into the real complexities of, of the argument, but for a big broad audience, it carries them on a, on a journey. And so, you know, that area of work is important to me as well. I'd like to find other projects that, that can do that, that have that broad sort of popular appeal and maybe can't always deal with nuance that you might want to talk to if you're talking to a royal court audience mm. but in quite sort of big colorful warm sort of human yeah. brushstrokes can can talk to a, a big audience and, and move them to a place that they've never been or haven't considered in that way in, in so. that sense yeah. transform them to a much bigger respect than you might you know yeah, an audience I mean, in Square. Yeah, you, I mean you never know all the experiences yeah. that audience has but just that sort of collective sense of yeah I mean that's one thing that strikes me that people on the comedy circuit still sort of have, you know, they, they have to test their jokes and things, but they, they tour around outside of London yeah, yeah. And, and very much have to, you know, okay, we tell our jokes in Cardiff, we tell our jokes in York, some community halls, whatever, and they, they really get immediate feedback about what works or what doesn't work. And I have, um, I guess, some friends who would probably consider themselves working class and go, you know what, you know, theatre isn't isn't my thing. I feel it's an elite high art thing. They don't speak to me and that type of thing. And, and comedy seems to have still got closer to that in a way that at least some, and then that's it. So whether you could argue these center right people don't have a thing or these working class people don't have a thing, feel that they're represented in theater. The rainbow flag doesn't feel like it's represented. So it, it, it feels like actually there was a bigger gap than a lot of theater people uh, might think. And actually this is where great work, uh, like like you say, born dress and things like that actually closes that gap on many levels and it can be popular as well. It doesn't have to be uh, yeah. for that sort of narrow, uh, na that narrow audience. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly an area of work that I'd like to, like to explore. You know, I think it's, it's, you know, it's great sometimes to be in London and have uh, sort of share stuff with people who are pretty much sort of your peers or whatever, but you know, I think it's a really good test to also sometimes step outside of that. You know, again, I'm sort of always opting for trying all the different, <laughs> all, the diff all the different things. Well, I'd, so that brings me back to the part on visual art I wanted to pick up on because um, I guess when Chopping and Fucking came out, there was a kind of YBA thing and it was like loosely associated with that sort of art movement. And then, and maybe at a time, I guess there's a phrase of in your face theater. I'm not sure I completely agreed with all of that, but there was a, there was a time where there sort of, there seemed to be a theater movement and a visual arts movement. Mm. Um, and then it actually seems to have like decayed away and visual arts are doing their own thing, particularly in the British one and, and still very much there. Um, and that link with theater hasn't 
been there as much. Whereas, like you say, in, in Germany and even to a extent in the US, it seems to be a little bit of a uh, of a yeah, of a yeah. closer link. Um, yeah. I mean, we're not a very visual, I mean, oddly unvisual sort of culture, really, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was any great dialogue between the, the YBA and the, and the plays that are being written time, but there was just something in the air. So that, yeah, that's, that's it's that period that being happening. sorted for ease and whiz, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, and happening in music. There wasn't like a massive dialogue between them that I was aware of, but the, these things all seemed to sort of emerge at the same time. So obviously they sort of, there was something zeitgeisty, but actually, um, you know, and I can't claim I to be. I, I can't claim that I am either. But but to actually be aware of the sort of language of talking about vi visual arts and referring to contemporary visual artists, uh, it's somehow not not in our culture. I'm always, you know, Germans always a little bit surprised. They start referring to stuff to do from the visual arts, and I sort of look a bit confused. They say, okay. well, you must know the work of so and so. <laughs> They're the most important photographer of the last ten years, yeah. and you go, but just. Don't. Just don't, yeah. And I don't know why that's that does not. That's that's. I guess it goes back to taking all those visual images down off the church walls in the. Yeah, the maybe, next, and and this was I, I was sort of hinting at that just because that you know that interlink about whether theatre really reaches out or uh, to the extent that it has in history with all of these you know the other creative arts you know the outside of London, um, all of those type of things. Uh, yeah, no conundrum. So maybe people will disagree there. They'll say, actually, you know, yeah, all yeah. of this work is based on, on the church and these uh, visual things. Um, and then the last one on art is just because it's uh, just on the mind. I was reading a critic in the New York Times recently who was commenting on this Titian show, which has gone sort of global, these six uh, brilliant old master works, which I think on terms of visual arts have been, uh, you know, consensus are masterpieces. Um, but they were writing about how, um, I guess this comes under this right to offend idea that the themes in a lot of these paintings, you know, essentially male gods dressing up, raping women and that type of thing are now, when you look at it in a modern day lens, uh, you know, very difficult for us. So there's this, this interesting tension, but it's far enough in, in history that we can, we can reconcile that. Uh, but if you fast forward that to more recently, I think there's kind of now quite a lot of uh, challenges uh, creatively we're having with themes or work or I guess artists own lives you know whether they've been troubled or have difficult politics or different personal lives mm -hmm. diverse from their art or not and then to how much extent that we have the right to offend whether you're discussing things around you know identity or politics or just stories stories that you think represent yourselves uh, do you view us as a, a particularly more challenging time now or is it just an iteration of some of these age-old conflicts with, which we had between the sort of creative, the political, the personal, and, and the public. Do you, and, and do you think these are questions that theatre should be asking now, or indeed is, is kind of correctly asking now? Yeah, I think I have quite sort of conflicted feelings about that. I mean, I, you know, certainly my um, sense growing up uh, and, you know, sort of discovering, you know, mostly sort of teaching myself, uh, was that you know it was good it was good to be exposed to uh, art from all different periods of history and things that had values that were totally different from from our time and that and that you didn't have to uh, endorse or agree with something to to read it or to look at it and stuff so that's sort of the um, way of thinking that that I grew up with so I, I guess that's quite ingrained for me now I can see that some people would say well that's okay because you know you're a white man so maybe you can go well let's look at all sorts of stuff that's 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 uncomfortable and uh difficult and and you're not as you know as a white man you're not as um threatened or offended or unsettled by going I was, you know I can see that there were an argument so I'm sort of, you know, in two minds about this. I can see there's an argument to say it's much easier for a position of privilege to say I'm going to expose myself to all these different troubling images or troubling narratives and stuff. Um, but I feel a bit regretful if we just write off whole areas of the history of literature and art and stuff. But, I, but you know, that's where I am from the generation that I am and the background that I have. So I think that's a decision that, individuals have 
I've got to make. And I think it's and I think it's not a bad thing that at the moment we're more mindful of what causes offence and what troubles or and and what's upset. I think you know I think there was a a danger that it almost became a habit to be sort of provocative mm, for the sake of it, mm. for the sake of it, and sort of a little bit, sort of a little bit cowardly in a way, a little bit like sort of kids playing, sort of knock down ginger the game knock down you when you knock on somebody's door and run away but sort of provoking and they're not really taking any response responsibility for that so it's a different we're in a different era and so it needs if, and if you've grown up you know before that as i've done it needs a little bit of like navigating and finding way around it but on the whole i think it's good that uh and certainly produces different work will produce different work for me that you're more mindful about the possibility of upset and offence. And maybe it's not necessarily always a good instinct to go, I'm really, good. you know, I don't know, hopefully I never did that, but just that the, the, the provocative is is necessarily good in itself. Yeah, not without that's, substance. I, yeah, and I think that's one of the theme in some of these conversations, if I had to sort of uh, condense that, that we are, or, the better thinkers, I'd like to say, are, are, are simply listening more to all of the sp yeah. spectrum of stories, people and humanity coming through. Yeah. And in previous generations, of... that was harder or like not yeah. that. And yeah, there's a lot of emphasis. On... Than... Yeah, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, from libertarians on free speech and the right to speak and stuff. Um, but there are rights and responsibilities so i think if you have the right to speak they have to make sure that everybody has that right and historically that's been very very unevenly distributed but also anybody who's given the right to speak has the responsibility to listen as well so i think there's been a lot of emphasis placed on the right to speak by the and people fighting for it who've always historically had the right to speak anyway while lots of other people have only ever really had the opportunity to listen so I think it's a sort of redistribution of, of that right to speech, trying to distribute that as widely as you possibly can, and ultimately, you know, completely, completely democratically. And then also once people have been given that uh, right to speak, also understanding and being educated and the responsibility to listen. So I think that's a project that takes generations, but I think that's a really exciting project. And, and actually the, speaking and listening are such key uh, parts of the theatre both on stage and in the audience that there's something very theatrical about exploring the redistribution of the right to speak and the and the education of the responsibility to listen sounds a bit dry but I think even you know very li <laughs> lively entertaining plays can really explore that yeah, and like like you say, it's it's I mean, uniquely suited to theatre and uniquely reflective of being human, right? The right to speak yeah. and the ability yeah. ability to listen. Great. Um, I thought I'd do a, a small section of kind of overrated, underrated, sort of quick fire, or you can do correctly <laughs> rated uh, okay. little things, and then uh, I have a couple okay. of uh, final sort of advice uh, uh, questions. Although I wanted to also uh, touch on Keith Johnston, who I know has been quite important. Uh, to you so overrated underrated you can pass if it says but overrated or underrated um automatic writing or just writing it out uh, underrated overrated i guess underrated i mean i think it's really it's really important to to have that ability at various stages in in the process to be just 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 unlock the mind and cover pages if you, I think you need that. You need that. You then need to have the opposite skill of uh, different stage Editing, being able yeah. to edit, edit and shape. But I think to train yourself and to learn that ability to just splurge is is a, is an important part of a writer's toolkit. Great. Great. Um, attempting to speak in verse all day, or at least for a significant length of time. Underrated. Definitely worth doing. I did a fantastic class workshop thing with some Lambda students once where we did a whole afternoon of improvising in in rhyming couplets uh, and it, it 
becomes scatological and rude so so quickly uh, and it's very very funny and we couldn't believe that for about two or three hours all the improvisations were in uh, rhyming couplets right. and it i have never laughed so much one of those times when you really fear that you might die from <laughs> laughter very good um dressing up to find yourself or find your character or i guess these are outside in ways of of thinking about the world yeah again i guess on the whole under underrated i mean i think having um some clothes to put on and uh, right at the beginning of rehearsals is it's really good again that's that strange one of the sort of anomalies about the english theater is that we we rehearse and rehearse and rehearse these plays without adding in any of the sort of material aspects of of often of what's going to be in them and and that's one of the differences with the german theater that what from they have the majority of rehearsals are in costumes wigs sets lighting the whole production is made as a production rather than people in their own clothes with a marked up floor and then suddenly at the end all this extra stuff every other aspect of the production thrown at it so yeah i get, get, get yeah i say get a costume on as soon as you can great um and then um how about chekhov or maybe i guess i'm thinking about uh, non-english theater from a point of view of, of british theater well chekhov specifically uh I just, yeah, still, I mean, still, I guess, under, underrated. I mean, you, I don't think you can rate Chekhov <laughs> highly enough. Anything I mean, funny. What he's, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, those plays are just extraordinary. So, um, yeah, I don't think we've, you know, it took, it took the English theatre uh, quite a few decades to catch on to yeah. Chekhov. A uh, long time after other, other countries. And we're still, but we, you know, and, and we, but we're now like, you know, uh, 60, 70, 80 years into quite substantial production of Chekhov, but they still keep on throwing up. Yeah, I could quite happily watch yeah, Chekhov yeah. play once a week for the rest of my life. Great. Um, and then uh, maybe the last one on this uh, would be uh, theatre games or maybe games in general. Okay, well, they're maybe overrated. Um, I think if you're going to rehearse a play, uh, for me, it's become too often a bit of a habit that the first hour, two hours, some, some rehearsal process have been in the first three hours of the day <laughs> That's uh, a um, uh, are spent playing games. The, I think the best way to trust each other, communicate with each other, play with each other is through the play through the work yeah 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 so yeah i mean yes if i if i were setting some rules for the theater police i would i would ban uh during the rehearsal process theater games i think they're great for training and great in other contexts and maybe you'd be allowed like one hour maximum for the whole rehearsal process or something yeah but but I, yeah, it's just on the whole, it's the director just putting off like the actual responsibility of getting the rehearsal started. And I have seen them stretch into like the third hour of the day. And it's just like, no, <laughs> do some well, work. Yeah. You can have, you can have all you can, you know, you really will trust each other if you if you're rehearsing the scene together. Yeah, exactly. Or you get a, get a team which trusts one another. Great. Okay. And then um, maybe just a final kind of two or three questions then. So one was around Keith Johnston's book, Improv, which actually does have a bunch of games in it, although a lot of them are really designed, uh, I feel, for exercises. And interestingly, a lot of them were really exercises kind of designed by, uh, by writers. So uh, I, um, I guess it's not an underrated book because sort of every, most theatre practitioners come across it. Uh, but I'm always surprised that actually uh, not a lot of them have actually tried to do either the whole book or even significant points of it. They kind of almost look at it as a kind of historic foundational test as text rather than actually very live um, practitioner text. Um, is this something, these exercises you still use today or teach from or how yeah. important is it? I mean, it's obviously uh, enormously important for uh, uh, improv uh, performance people, but I actually think it's underratedly important actually for all theatre practitioners or writers or whichever yeah. arc you come from. Yeah, I mean, I bought a copy when I was at university and uh, did dip in and out of it, uh, directing. We sort of devised a show, so I sort of dipped in and out of it, uh, finding 
techniques to sort of devise a student show. But I hadn't read the introduction, I don't think, because it was then sitting on my shelf for a few years. And then when I pulled it out years later and read the introduction and realized that this whole stuff that's in the book had begun in the Royal Court Writers Group. Uh, there wasn't even a writers group. Keith was asked to found a writers group and they sat in the room and said, what is a writers group? I don't think anybody had had one before in the UK. What are we going to do? And they started to try stuff out um, and people chucking in ideas and Keith sort of facilitating it. And once I read that it was sort of Angelico and Edward Bond and I think maybe Wallace Shreinka and all these people in the theatre upstairs, that wasn't the theatre upstairs then, just a sort of abandoned room, trying to find out what the essence of uh, drama was and how it's going to inform their playwriting. Once I realised it was sort of playwrights who, with Keith, who sort of initiated all that, it sort of spun my head around. So then I, I started, um, and thinking that I wanted to write myself, I just sort of started going through the book and just sort of uh, drawing on it to make up my own writing exercises. So instead of being in a room and improvising a play, I just, a kitchen table and just would sort of open it and flick through and think, now that, and sometimes they would quite quickly translate into an exercise that you could do on the page, or sometimes I'd have to sort of think of what the essence of it was and sort of invent it myself. But I sort of gave myself a sort of, you know, summer, summer's course in like playwriting exercises through dipping into that book. So that's really what got me started playwriting. Great. Um, and maybe ending with the last kind of uh, couple of uh, questions broadly, what do you, what sort of questions do you think uh, theatre should be asking today? Or I guess this is partly uh, a question for the theatre industry as a whole. And then are you particularly have any things you're particularly curious about, which you, you think are very worth uh, investing, uh, investigating? Uh, I guess this partly alludes to, um, there's a lot of talk in theatre about maybe building back better or differently, which is a, a country sort of uh, conversation about uh, how everything might be affected. And then just, I guess, the nature of some of the questions and challenges uh, of our time now. Well, I think a really fundamental question is, uh, you know, as with so much of our lives is the, the, the disconnect between theatre and this huge thing, which we know is like the most important thing of the next hundred years of climate change and where, where the theatre sits, sits with that. Um, it's, we're still only really tiny, tiny baby steps. Um, and I think the theatre pretty much is, yeah, historically, certainly the Western tradition, you know, it is a humanist tradition. It's a thing that places the human being at the center of the, of the universe and of the world, pretty much the exclusion of anything else. A play is about what human beings do to, e do to each other. So some other cultures and other um, civilizations did, were more, much more sort of humble about man's humanities position, in the position, world. Yeah. position in the world and their relationship to the, to the natural world. And in a way, the very central act of making theatre was to say, I am, I human being am, am, am the centre of the world. So yeah, we can, you know, obviously there's lots of just uh, practical things to do about uh, theatre's contribution to a, a carbon zero economy and all, all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, I think there's a really huge question is is just the actual basic humanist instinct of theatre an act of aggrandizing humanity above its place in the natural order and it, can you make theatre if you think of the natural world as well a as our, ourselves as being part of the natural world and not stepping outside of it and also that natural world being bigger and in many ways more powerful than ourselves, that would be to sort of give up humanism. And would that mean to give up theatre? I think that's a huge and probably unanswerable okay. question. But, but a, a post, not post-human, because that's that sort of takes you down the road of the sort of cyborg sort of future. Uh, AI, sci-fi. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not so interested in like a post-human sort of cyborg theatre, but a sort of humanity humbled, uh, uh, yeah, and whatever it would be, a non-humanist theatre. What does that, is that, is there, is there even a thing or does theatre just stop to be, cease to be? Yeah, that is super interesting. It's got my brain whizzing because I think, you know, you had communities or you hear stories, you know, in older times, people would, people would perform for trees and rivers because they thought, you know, why would the river not be as powerful uh, or the tree is powerful? You know, it sustains our life. It's there. It lives longer than me. Why would I not have some sort of uh, yeah. relationship with it? I mean, not what we would think of as theater today, but certainly some performative act with uh, yeah. a non-human uh, uh, actor. There's that. Yeah. And what would that mean going forward? Because obviously it's dangerous to like be nostalgic <laughs> and, and sort of, uh, idealized sort of ancient civilization so rather than to go oh i wish i was living five with a tree years, yeah five thousand years wearing ago, any bark clothing <laughs> what, yeah what would it mean moving forward i don't know that's the that's a question that's playing around in my head and i'm pretty confident i'll never know the answer to but but it might that's be okay playwrights don't need the answers <laughs> it's interesting to um yeah it's interesting to sort of conceive of that so but, you know, I think, yes, we've got somehow this disjunct, you know, it, it, it is almost impossible at the moment to find a theatre form uh, where we can talk about this thing. And, and also you know, all sorts of other forms where, where we can talk about this thing, which we, which, you know, now the vast, vast majority of acknowledge, acknowledges that you know, it's, it's the most fundamental. It's thing. existential risk, which, which yeah, is interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. I find it's really interesting looking back over the last 10 or 20 years, I can't really find, maybe there's one or two, and I think uh, I'm thinking of climate work here. M maybe April D'Angelis has put on one and there's been a, a couple that, but, but really there haven't been that successful theater making around climate because the nature of the form seems to be so hard to grapple with this. I'm, to be fair to theater, it's been quite hard in books and other creative work, full stop. Yeah, yeah. Maybe because of your provocation, because it's uh, art is typically or essentially a human endeavor and climate and the natural world is essentially, well, humans are a part of it, but we are actually in that context, a small part. And therefore our art seems to have real trouble encompassing that. And actually our policy and minds seem to have real trouble with our intersection with that world, which would seems to be, an, you know, to your point, an existential real question for theatre to try and grapple with, or, or perhaps it can't really, which is, uh, which is probably an interesting question in itself. Yeah, yeah, no, there was a nice uh, quote in the Charles Ludlam book that I'm reading, who uh, had this theatre in New York called The Theatre of Ridiculous, and uh, he said something about, I'm really paraphrasing now, but if you're if you're not failing to live up to your ideals, then you haven't set your ideals high enough. So I think, you know, you accept that you're not going to live up to your ideals, but, but that gap between setting your ideals as high as you can, like, let's say the sort of idea of like returning ourselves into a humility to nature and existing within nature, that high ideal and, and the gap between, <laughs> but the gap between us attempting that, uh, that's often a rich area for creating art, I think. That gap yeah. between the ideas. And if you don't set your ideals the... high enough, we, we just don't seem to produce as good a stuff in, in kind of whatever our endeavors are. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Great. Um, and then um, my last question would be do you have um, any um, advice for, well, I guess we could do a, a couple of types of people, like <laughs> advice maybe uh, for creatives or young people. Or maybe you could think, uh, maybe you have advice or thoughts uh, just in, in general on, on, on being human, I guess. Um, that's maybe very wide, but you might have one <laughs> on, for theatre people and creators in, in particular, but you might have sparked them like, actually, you know what, this is, we, the, we touched upon a couple of things about sort of uh, listening and, and some, of these, uh, some of these gaps and representation. Um, but I, yeah, I would be interested if you had any uh, other advice or thoughts that you'd like to share with people. I think, um, okay, I think this advice for creatives, well, may, maybe this applies to every, everybody in the world. Um, you know, there's a curious thing. I think what people ultimately want from you as a creative is your 
unique voice. But actually so much of what they offer along the way, uh, mentoring and script editing and criticizing and training and everything, uh, doesn't, facilitate, doesn't facilitate that. And you grow to be watchful of trying to, trying to please people and trying to fit in. And lots of young, obviously mostly writers that I come in, am I allowed to do this? Will they like this? Will... And um, because that's a lot of the signals that, that you're sort of given along this way of like people actually genuinely, when they get it, they want that unique voice. It's not to say you can't learn, particularly in training or, and te teach yourself. I don't think it's, it's innate, but um, in the search to find that unique voice, people often throw so much stuff at it that you end up with people who just want to work out how to jump through these hoops and please these people and, are, and actually even get quite scared. Am I even allowed to do this? So actually returning yourself all the time to ultimately what they want, even though they're giving me these very different signals, is a unique voice. And to earn that unique voice, you've got to be very honest with yourself very rigorous with yourself tough tough with yourself but you do it to yourself and, huh. and form and shape and honor honor that unique voice so i think you know and it has grown culturally over the last sort of 30 years but that sort of endlessly mentored endlessly workshop endlessly edited endlessly everything sort of culture uh facilitates against that but when you genuinely do develop and hone and offer your unique voice it is still the most precious thing and people will be, be excited by it and 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 honor it but it needs you know that needs uh confidence in yourself and actually some arrogance i think we've very, you know culturally we're very keen now on uh humility and niceness, particularly in England, obviously niceness, but actually the act of making your own work has got to have um, a strong element of arrogance about it as well, I think. So don't be afraid to own things like arrogance. Yeah, I, that seems really insightful to me because I sort of see young theatre makers or writers and how I would put it is, they are trying to write to somebody else's tick box, yeah. which is doubly worse because one, it's somebody else's. And secondly, it's a kind of tick box that, you know, you're, you're just trying to work towards this note and you might have contradictory notes. Um, and therefore you're not building anything, which is, which is yourself. Yeah. So. I mean, I think if you, if you know where you're really, where you want to be with a piece, I mean, you know, plays go through draft after draft after draft after draft, at least mine do and most people's do. If you really have got a gut feeling about where this piece is want to go, if, if other people are giving you feedback, you will sometimes or quite often hear things that you can really use and then you can filter and go, wow, mm -hmm. yeah, that I, uh, but only if those notes are feeding that sort of gut instinct of, I need to say this, I need to find a way to, to say this. Yeah. Once you're off beam and you're, you're writing different drafts of a play or whatever it might be to satisfy all the different things that are coming at you, uh, you know, you've, you've sort of lost it, really, and you might as well be doing another type of, <laughs> another type of a job, yeah. really, really, if it's, if it's about that, yeah. Yeah, so, but, but maybe that just applies to life, life yeah. in, in, in general as well. No I, think more, no, I think more that, yeah, I guess, but I, I think specifically to the work, making oh, yeah. the work of, work of art. I'm not, I don't think maybe in general in life that a strong sense of ownership of your own arrogance is a good thing. I think that's peculiar to the yeah. work of making making a work of art. And it's not arrogance about yourself, it's arrogance about the work. Okay. So I think actually, I think actually, you know, in many ways the the arrogance is there for the work. And in, in, in some ways that can be quite cathartic. And hopefully you can be have more humility in the rest of your life. Okay. Although I, I might apply to a sense of uh, a sense of self, not sort of arrogance in, you know, how your strength of opinion, but just on who you are. I guess I meet young people who, you know, again, that they're, they're told how to be. So this is not, and they have all of these conflicting messages. 
and I just say, well, just ask yourself honestly how you how you want to be if you can and, and follow that thread, which seems to me a, a similar thing, you know, wouldn't necessarily touch it with arrogance, but just listening to yourself and then going, well, if, if, if that's you, you don't have to listen to all of these other people about how to be when you've got a sense, your own, develop your own sense about how to be. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And so as a productive day, a lot of writing for you or like two or three hours of writing when you're not, I guess, oh, productive um, day rehearsing would be, you're in the rehearsal room and you get lots of great stuff done. Um, yeah, no, writing I normally find, because I, I do, um, I don't really, I quite often even turn off the phone and I don't check the internet and stuff. So, so when I'm writing is total concentration. Uh, I think which is quite unusual for people working. I read an article once that said the amount of time people in an office in their seven, eight hour day, how much time did they actually spend doing the job that was on their job description? And I thought it was going to say like two hours out of the eight or something, but I think it's something like about 37 minutes. <laughs> really, that that low? I was going to say it's quite going, low. Get, get, taking messages for somebody else, going to get yeah, the there is I don't know, all the, and then answering emails about parking spaces and blah, blah, whatever. That the actual job description job was something like, um, it was considerably less than an hour, I think. So actually, I think when I'm writing, I've got no other emails to do about, you know, the parking space, and I've got no water cooler to go to, and people are not, oh, they're not in the office, can I take a message? Blah, blah. So I just, it's full on concentration. So I find after about three hours, that actually I'm sort of a bit punch drunk. So I find about three hours a day of writing is, is, is enough, but I, by the sound of it, it's equivalent to about three weeks. <laughs> yeah, today. Well, do you do, are you morning, afternoon, after some Pilates or ballet, or you can do really it anytime? It really varies. Right. It really varies. Just when I'm writing something, I just say that I will write. I normally set myself a word count, like a thousand words a day. And sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm full of it, and I and I write my thousand words. But sometimes I, I haven't I'm got a little lack of confidence or something or whatever, and I just put it off and off. But if I'm actually in the got a deadline or whatever I won't let myself go to bed until I've written those thousand words so if the very worst comes to worst I'm there at 11 o'clock at night until sort of one two in the morning to actually getting out the words yeah, yeah so yeah. I think you might be right there's a recent piece in the Wall Street Journal which has done the business rounds about a lot of people taking two jobs in during the pandemic because they can because mm -hmm. they don't have to be present so online and they juggle them both so these people yeah. who are wanting to do to do that and it it, it seems to be a a thing so so maybe you're right. I'm I'm still quite influenced by, um, I think if I recall correctly, you set up the workshops, uh, maybe based on something that uh, Sarah Kane had said in, this is going back about 20 years ago, but, but doing an espresso weekend. So getting a lot of work done in like, you know, four hours writing it or writing yeah. all over a weekend, a, a lot yeah. of surge of work. Uh, and so I've always like, like tried to write more and not I just kind of all, things. I think that was all Sarah's thing, but yeah. I think she just felt that, um, yeah, that quite a lot of uh, people, I, I, I think at all stages of their writing career, but uh, near the beginning, that there's so much procrastination, but actually it was all inside them because they, they talked about it and thought about it for years and years. And that if you actually just said, you've got to write this in, it was like a long weekend. Like weekend yeah, playing a long weekend, I think that was and, it. And we were at Payne's Plough, so you could, and the, we opened up the building, so you'd actually come yeah. and write. Right was there. that place in Aldwych, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And people could, people could uh, we tried to sort of hang around and bring people cups of coffee and stuff if they needed it. So quite a lot of people's plays, a lot of people surprised themselves and found that they could write like an hour, an hour and a half, half's worth of material in sort of three days, or whatever it was. And I think it did kickstart a lot of a lot of plays that, but it was entirely Sarah's thing that actually we, if you'd had a sort of lock in, that it would get people actually having to sit down to write instead of spending another year sort of taking it off. It was painful, yeah. yeah. Great, so and then any other final advice? <laughs> we, can, we can pass of that, because we've done the creative. Oh God, I don't know whether I'm in a position to give anybody any advice, any general area. Ben, any, just give me, a, what, what sort of problem would you well, like? I, I, what area of I, life? I, <laughs> uh, well, I would like, so I would, I, I guess I'm hinting towards perhaps if you are, uh, a minority as in this is probably if you're not a straight white male or you're not feeling like that and maybe you're youngish and you're thinking you know there's a lot of contradictory things you hear on social media your friends are saying different things you know this this is the wider than just like a coming out but just a kind of 
trying to yeah. find your sense and place in your world seems to me, I'd like to say as difficult as it ever been, but actually it strikes to me when I speak to some of the young people that I still do a little bit, it seems to be harder than, than, than it was like maybe in our uh, generation or like call it 80s, 90s, early 2000s, where obviously there was all of that and there was things and, you know, there was other things we were dealing with like um, HIV and all of that. But then, but then today you've got this whole other plethora and, uh, and I think young people are finding it I, seemingly really hard. Um, yeah, I didn't know if you had a thought on that. Yeah, sort of contradiction, isn't it? Because if you're a sort of young gay teen, you can very quickly on social media find like, you know, thousands find of hours. Tribe. Yeah, gay gay TikToks made by other gay teens and YouTube. There's like a hundred thousand coming out stories on on YouTube from from gay teens and stuff. So you've got sort of access to things that, my gen, you know, definitely like pre-internet. So you didn't even know, it didn't even hear anybody's coming out story or something. So I guess it reflects a lot of the wider sort of world. So there is actually access to all this like information or even just knowing that there are you know hundred thousand subscribers to that youtube channel of this gay team that really speaks to you and stuff and yet that doesn't seem to so it can sort of be, offer a little bit of reassurance but then crossing that over into the real world i mean people get there in the end don't they but crossing over that into the real world how you actually make friendships and then relationships and long-lasting relationships um doesn't necessarily seem to help that much towards those, does it? And in some ways, learning the whole vocabulary of everything through mediated sort of virtual reality maybe makes it even harder to... Yeah, this messy humanness. Yeah, I yeah. guess it's just a wider problem for, for us in a sort of, uh, yeah, virtual world, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. So that, that's not advice. That's not... <laughs> <laughs> just, that's fine. It's just an observation about... Uh, where we have yeah no I I actually slightly blame uh, dating apps partly for mm. the fact that we don't speak to like wider circles of of people because um, if you know if you go back pre-app you'd have to kind of meet a lot of people to see whether yeah. they might be lifelong partners or not and most of them are not going to be right by their nature yeah. but you have yeah. either interesting conversations or get-togethers be because you had to put yourself out there and now because the app and algorithm thinks it can do do that for you and for all other reasons you do that and so actually uh your that sort of thing is potentially more narrow and so this messiness of the conversation of of figuring it out does seem to be well, a little I've bit got, harder I've got, I've got a piece of advice which is come to the king's head theater yes where I'm everything is where everything is live everything is live and you will almost certainly meet your life partner that yeah. and that's talk, talk to them in the bar or during the or at the end of the show you will meet your life partner at the King's Head Theatre. So when Hannah and I take over in Easter 22, it's the place to come for dating. Yeah, and really that is the only reason, right, to write plays is to try and find <laughs> your life partner, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm... I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joking that, you probably, yeah. Don't. Anyway, super excited to chat. I am really also excited to find out how everything's going to go at the King's Head Theatre and you. your future work. So Mark, Great. thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. If you appreciate the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast.